th uh, thank you very much, Lee, for that kind introduction. And uh, of course, I want to uh, express my thanks uh, to uh, the College of Law and the University uh, and the Stranahan Foundation, uh, the Federalist Society, uh, President Jacobs, uh, Dean Steinbach, uh, and especially to Lee, who has uh, made this all possible. Uh, to the faculty members and, and, and I guess most of all to the students who are attending this lecture, uh, people from the community. Uh, I see there are some distinguished members of the bench uh, in the room. Thank you all uh, for listening to me. I, I flew here from London yesterday uh, and I was uh, in London for uh, a bittersweet event. Uh, my introduction to uh, the role of virtue in moral philosophy uh, uh, came uh, in a course offered by one of the uh, uh, past century's most distinguished moral philosophers, uh, Philippa Foote at UCLA. Uh, sadly, Philippa passed away uh, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, and uh, this past weekend, a memorial service and conference in her honor uh, was held at Oxford University in Somerville College, uh, the place where Philippa began and ended her teaching career. Uh, so uh, uh, one final note of thanks, which is a thanks to Philippa Foote. This, this lecture would not be happening uh, if it had not been for her amazing ability as an inspirational teacher. So uh, my topic today is Law and Virtue. And uh, I'm going to uh, begin uh, by talking about uh, virtue and its role in ethics or moral philosophy. And then I'll be talking about virtue in law. So I'll be uh, starting with virtue ethics and then moving to virtue jurisprudence. There are three great traditions in moral philosophy. Uh, one of these traditions is associated strongly with the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. Uh, the deontological tradition is uh, essentially the idea that there are moral rules or moral laws and that being moral is a matter of abiding with uh, the moral commands. Uh, that should govern our conduct. The second of the two traditions uh, is uh, strongly associated, especially in the law, with the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham uh, and his theory, utilitarianism, the view that the rightness or wrongness of an action depends on its consequences. And of course, Bentham thought that the morally important consequences all had to do with human pleasure and human pain. The third member of this family of theories is virtue ethics, or uh, an ethics founded on human character and human flourishing. And this tradition in ethics uh, is very old, uh, and it's strongly associated with the Greek philosopher Aristotle. This is not the occasion for uh, a full-scale introduction to Aristotle's moral philosophy. But I do want to mention, uh, he, although not reproduce, his most important argument, uh, the function argument. Uh, the idea of the function argument is that there is a uh, highest humanly achievable good, that there is an end uh, that is appropriate uh, to humans as uh, natural creatures in the world. And Aristotle's view of this good uh, which he called eudaimonia, sometimes translated as happiness, is intimately connected to the human virtues. So Aristotle believed that the highest humanly achievable good, the best kind of life for humans, was a life of rational and social activity in accord 
with the human excellences. Well, that is quite a mouthful. So let me try to break that down. Aristotle believed that human beings, um, as uh, distinguished with some of the other creatures in the natural world, uh, were essentially rational creatures, reason-using creatures, and that we were also essentially social creatures, that a distinctively human life would be a life that involved the use of reason in social contexts. And in particular, he believed that uh, the best kind of life for a human would be a life that expressed the human excellences, that is, that uh, lived up to the highest capacities that humans possess. So these human excellences, the Greek word was erite, are the virtues. And Aristotle's theory is a virtue-centered theory. It sees the good life as a life in which one is in possession of and one lives in accord with these virtues. So what are the human virtues? What are the excellences that are characteristic of human beings? Aristotle divided the virtues into two categories, intellectual virtues and moral virtues. And I'll say just a word or two about each of these categories and of some of the many virtues that fall under the categories. So among the theoretical virtues, the intellectual virtues, the virtues of the mind, Aristotle classified Sophia, or wisdom, or more particularly, theoretical wisdom, uh, and phrenesis, or practical wisdom. So, Theoretical wisdom is the kind of virtue that we would associate with the acquisition of systematic knowledge. Uh, so, for instance, theoretical virtue would be a virtue that's um, distinctively expressed by someone who engages in theoretical activities like physics or mathematics. Uh, in the law, we might think of theoretical wisdom as the virtue that um, enables one to grasp complex systems of legal rules. So perhaps to the first year law student, theoretical wisdom or Sophia would be the virtue that would enable uh, command over complex doctrines like the rule against perpetuities. Uh, more important uh, to Aristotle's way of understanding human beings and the way that they could flourish in the world was his account of the virtue of practical wisdom, or phrenesis. And the person who possesses this virtue, a, a, a human being uh, who has practical wisdom, who has phrenesis, the Greeks called a phronomos, a person of practical wisdom, a human who has this virtue. So what is practical wisdom? Well, this is tricky because practical wisdom is an elusive concept. Uh, and in fact, we're familiar in our ordinary lives with its elusiveness. So there are some people who we recognize have um, good judgment common sense, an ability to see what's important in a particular situation uh, and to recognize which possibilities for action are practical, workable, efficacious, and those that are not. So th there are uh, competing models of this virtue of practical wisdom, but the one that um, attracts me and that I believe is correct analogo analogizes practical wisdom to a perceptual capacity. So we might think of practical wisdom as akin to moral vision. Uh, a human with practical wisdom can look at a choice situation uh, and see which features of the choice situation are morally salient. What's important in this choice that I must make? 
and uh, then look at options and see which options are workable and practical and desirable. So this is a metaphor. Uh, uh, the metaphor expresses the idea that practical wisdom uh, gives us the ability to size up the situation and to recognize the choice involving features of the situation, to recognize which values are important and which values less important, uh, which aspects of the situation we should attend to, and which aspects of the situation we can set aside. Those are intellectual virtues. And Aristotle also thought that human beings uh, could develop what he called moral virtues. Uh, and examples of Aristotelian moral virtues include courage, uh, good temper, uh, temperance, and justice. And let me, let me just say a word about one of those virtues, courage, as an example. So what is the virtue of courage? Aristotle believed that each of the moral virtues, save one, was a disposition to the mean with respect to a morally neutral emotion. Again, a mouthful. Let me see if I can explain. Courage. Courage is a disposition with respect to fear. Uh, fear is a natural human emotion, and it's a very good thing that we human beings uh, uh, experience this emotion, that we experience fear, because fear alerts us to danger. Uh, but uh, some human beings uh, have a disorder with respect to this emotion. Uh, they uh, experience too much fear. Right? They're afraid of things in a way that is disproportionate to the actual danger, or they uh, uh, react to fear in an excessive way. Right? Even a small fear will drive them into flight. Uh, so someone who has that vice, which we could now call cowardice, someone who has this vice of cowardice, uh, will not lead a flourishing life because when danger threatens, they'll make inappropriate judgments. They won't face up to dangers that should be faced up to. Uh, they'll avoid uh, situations that involve dangers that um, are uh, overcomable uh, or insignificant. And likewise, uh, there's another vice sort of on the other side of the spectrum. There are some people who are foolhardy, uh, who are rash, uh, who are not alert to dangers that ought to be avoided. And we're all familiar with these people as well. They take risks uh, that are not worth running. Uh, they walk into dangerous situations uh, when uh, uh, anyone uh, with uh, a well-ordered sense of fear uh, would avoid the danger. So courage is a disposition to the mean. It's the disposition to feel anger that is proportionate to the danger and to respond to that anger uh, in the right way. And likewise with other human emotions. So anger, for example, you can see exactly how this would go, uh, falls on the same, into the same kind of pattern. Some people have a disposition to too much anger. They have what we call, uh, in modern uh, psychological jargon, an anger management problem. And it gets them into trouble. And other people uh, don't feel anger when it's appropriate. When people are invading their space or their rights or injuring people who are near and dear to them, they don't respond with appropriate anger. They let other people walk all over them. Right? Good temper, proades is the Greek word, 
is the disposition to the mean, to feel anger that's appropriate to the situation. So um, the last of these uh, virtues that are moral in nature is justice, uh, a, a virtue that's important to the law uh, and that is characteristic or distinctive in the case of law. So I will postpone discussion of that virtue uh, uh, and turn now directly to the topic of virtue jurisprudence. So what are the implications of Aristotle's theory of a virtue-centered approach to morality for the law? There are many ways we could ask that question. There are many ways of approaching this topic of a virtue jurisprudence. And on this occasion today, what I would like to do is to approach the topic by asking three questions. I'd like to ask a question about the virtues of lawyers. I'd like to ask a question about the virtues of judges. And then finally, I'll be asking a question about the virtues of lawmakers, of legislators. And if we bring, if we answer those three questions, I think we'll get at least a broad outline, a sketch of what a virtue jurisprudence would look like. So let me begin with lawyers' virtues and legal ethics. So most of us who are here in this room have uh, some sense of uh, how the legal system currently thinks about lawyers' ethics. Uh, we're familiar with the model rules of professional responsibility and of the idea that uh, the fundamental problem of lawyer's ethics is a problem of conflicting duty. On the one hand, uh, there is a duty to the client, a duty uh, that is sometimes articulated in terms of a duty of zealous representation. This is the duty to take the client's interests as your own and act as a lawyer uh, in the interests of the client. And uh, to do that uh, as if it were someone near and dear to you, that is to fulfill this duty with zeal. Uh, and on the other hand, we expect lawyers uh, to fulfill a duty to justice, a duty to the legal system. Uh, and therefore, we expect lawyers not to do things that would be in their clients' interests, but that would undermine the system of justice. So a lawyer may not uh, put on a witness knowing that the witness's testimony would be perjured. And a lawyer may not, at least in theory, perhaps not in fact, a lawyer may not in theory uh, use the rules of procedure in order to manipulate the court. For example, by making uh, a motion solely for the purpose of delay. So we have these two conflicting duties and then legal ethics attempts uh, to uh, create some kind of reconciliation or balance between the duties. Uh, one approach to reconciliation might be to attempt to create an intricate system of ethical duties that reconciles these two principles. And another approach might be to look to consequences, to, in a very utilitarian way, uh, 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 determine which rules will best promote uh, a reasonable balance of social interests or uh, in Bentham's uh, philosophy, which approach would maximize utility. So I want to suggest that a more uh, perspicuous approach to lawyers' ethics would ask the question, what are the virtues of a lawyer? And so 
uh, looking at a virtue-centered approach, I think immediately refocuses our attention on the proper role of a lawyer and in particular on the question, what does it mean to be an excellent lawyer? Uh, any approach that uh, focuses on lawyering in terms of duties or consequences misses something very important. A focus on duty leads us to the conclusion that lawyers are morally dubious because uh, they advance projects that clients have that themselves are in tension with uh, the system of moral rules. And in the popular culture, of course, this idea of the lawyer, this image of the lawyer as conniving and cutting corners and uh, enabling clients to do things that are morally questionable uh, is very powerful. And on the other hand, uh, a morality of consequences leads us to uh, see lawyers again uh, as uh, problematic. It looks like lawyers are not acting uh, to maximize the interests of society as a whole. Uh, in fact, again, there is a popular image that what lawyers do is consume the social product, right, in a way that's non-productive, and that lawyers are not interested in producing the public good precisely because they're interested in promoting the good of individual clients. Now, of course, there's much to be said in defense of these views, but there's another way of looking at this. And that other way would focus on the idea that it is possible to live an excellent life as a lawyer because lawyers engage in rational and social activities. And they do this in a distinctive way. There's a distinctive good associated with the practice of law. So that our question ought to be, how do I live a good life as a lawyer? How do I acquire the excellences of a lawyer? How can I live a flourishing life as a lawyer? Well, uh, the, the trick is going to be an understanding of the virtue of justice. And we're going to need an understanding of that virtue, the virtue of justice that connects justice with the law. And so that leads me to my next question, which is what are the virtues of a judge? Because it is in the case of a judge that the virtue of justice is going to come to the surface, that we're going to see the structure of this virtue. So uh, the virtues of judges, some of them are uh, uh, non-controversial. Some of the vices of judges are uh, incontestable. Uh, no one thinks that uh, an anger management problem makes you a better judge. No one thinks that uh, a coward is the best kind of judge. Uh, no one thinks that a good judge is ignorant of the law and has deficient, a deficient capacity for engaging in complex reasoning. That is, we would all agree that um, a good judge should be courageous, uh, have the virtue of good temper, uh, should be intelligent, uh, should have theoretical wisdom. Those judges, those judges 
with those virtues are well on their way uh, to judicial excellence, those without them uh, uh, cannot reliably be good judges. But there are two virtues that are more complex and also more controversial. The first of those is judicial wisdom. The distinctively um, legal or judicial form of the virtue of practical wisdom. So what does this mean, this idea of judicial wisdom? What is it to be a practically wise judge? Uh, there was a very great American legal theorist who I think got this exactly right, uh, Carl Llewellyn. Uh, Carl Llewellyn was uh, a great legal realist. Uh, he uh, was a principal author of the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, uh, he did pioneering work uh, in legal anthropology on the Cheyenne. And uh, he had a particular theoretical idea, and that is that good judging requires situation sense, right? That is, to be a good judge, you have to have legal vision. You need to be able to perceive what are the legally salient aspects of a case. You need to be able to discern uh, what approaches, what remedies, what orders, uh, what plans for the management of a trial are workable and which ones are going to be foolish, counterproductive, uh, and fail. In Aristotle, in book five of his Nicomachean Ethics, in chapter 10, Aristotle advanced a theory of what he called, in Greek, epiakia, uh, and uh, from the Latin, we call it equity. Uh, that is, Aristotle believed that uh, the law was inherently defective because of its generality. Uh, lawmakers, whether they be opinion writers or legislators, have only the tools of words to work with. Uh, and uh, words are general and abstract. Uh, they're never going to handle every case in exactly the right way. So Aristotle believed that a distinctive virtue, the virtue of equity, was necessary to correct the law's generality. That a good judge needed the capacity to size up the particular case and uh, to uh, bend the law so that it fit the case. Aristotle was no fan of uh, uncontrolled judicial discretion. Aristotle thought we should have the very best rules that we could get, that legislation should um, uh, do the best job possible in articulating clear criteria for the decision of cases. But even the best laws will need to be adapted. And even a very good law will occasionally run into a case that uh, it, if read literally, it would seem to govern, but in which it makes no sense, in which the spirit of the law, the purpose of the law, the functional construction of the law is simply inapplicable to the particular case. There's a second controversial virtue, and that's the virtue of justice. And um, the virtue of justice is obviously of extraordinary imp uh, importance for judges. But what is the virtue of justice? What uh, what is it that makes a human just? Well, Aristotle had an answer to this question that may surprise you. Uh, the core of Aristotle's theory of the virtue of justice sees an intimate and close connection between justice and law. But a caveat here. 
In ancient Greek, the word for law, uh, for a law, is nomos, for the law's nomoi. And this Greek word has a meaning that differs from the meaning of the word law in English. Fundamentally, the nomoi, the laws in Aristotle's time, were what we might today call social norms, connected to ideas of custom, of informal law. Aristotle believed that uh, human beings naturally developed in their communities a set of deeply held and widely shared social norms that governed human interaction. And that to be a just human means to internalize these social norms that to have the virtue of justice is to be nomomos, that is to be lawful in the sense that you share your community's deep norms. But there's a problem with this theory. What do we say about communities that have social norms that seem to us to be radically defective? And surely we're all familiar with the existence of such societies. Uh, Nazi Germany uh, is surely one. So not all social norms would be internalized by someone with practical wisdom uh, and the virtue of justice. Only those social norms that were consistent with, that bear the right relationship to the purpose of the nomoi, the purpose of law. And what is the purpose of law? The purpose of law is to create the conditions for human flourishing, that is, to create the conditions under which individuals and their communities can live lives involving rational and social activities that express the human excellences. So this means that understanding the virtue of justice is in part understanding that judges need to internalize the law, internalize the deeply held and widely shared social norms that are part of their community, and the positive laws which, are, which rest on the foundation of those norms. So positive law, the statutes, the court decisions, are authoritative and internalized by citizens and judges with the virtue of justice just to the extent that uh, they are consistent with the basic purpose of law, which is to promote human flourishing. So if you find yourself a judge in Nazi Germany and you possess the full range of human virtues, you're practically wise, you understand the role of positive law and of the nomoi, that means that you will reject the authority of some of the positive law. And in particular, a Nazi judge with the virtue of practical wisdom would understand that the racial laws of Nazi Germany could not be understood as laws that are consistent with law's basic purpose. What do you do in those circumstances? That's a hard question. You might try to subvert the law within. You might uh, resign your position of judge and join an opposition movement or go underground and uh, join a resistance movement. Uh, but you would not react to those laws by internalizing them and enforcing them with zeal. This brings us then to the last of our three questions. Uh, 
The virtue of justice uh, requires an appreciation of the purpose of law, uh, and so too does the activity of the legislator. Someone who uh, makes law, someone who uh, uh, enforces law in a way that requires that law be supplemented, either by practice or in the case of a common law system by interstitial law making, uh, people who are in those roles, humans who occupy those roles, need uh, uh, the distinctive virtues of the lawmaker. And in particular, they need to have a theoretical understanding of the ends of law and of the conditions of human social life that constrain the operation of law. So, uh, how might we tackle that problem? How could we engage in lawmaking that would uh, facilitate the flourishing of human individuals and communities and that would enable humans to develop the virtues? Well, one set of techniques uh, for lawmaking would aim directly at virtue. Uh, that is, how can we create the conditions in which human beings will develop their capacities, in which children will grow up into adults uh, who, to the greatest extent possible, uh, have the intellectual and moral capacities that enable and constitute uh, a flourishing life. So we would need to protect the institution of the family and provide conditions under which the primary job of child rearing, which is where the virtues are acquired in the first instance, can be done well. We would need to support communities, places where uh, children and young adults uh, can uh, uh, exercise, grow, develop, emulate, come to understand uh, uh, the human virtues. We would need to provide an educational system that would support uh, and facilitate the acquisition of virtue and not undermine it. Uh, and of course, we would also need to provide the material conditions under which uh, the virtues can be acquired. So uh, the virtues will be threatened uh, in a society of deprivation uh, or violence. And so the law must aim at uh, the goals of peace and prosperity, goals that anyone would think law should aim at, but that assume special importance in a virtue-centered view of lawmaking. There's a special problem, and it's on this special problem that I would like to end. So uh, an immediate difficulty that's faced by anyone who sees a strong relationship between law and virtue is uh, the challenge posed by liberal political theory. And in particular, the theory that it is the job of the state um, to do things that promote uh, what economists call public goods, to uh, uh, protect people's rights, to take measures necessary to preserve public health, but that uh, morality is not the business of the state. And so liberals are traditionally opposed to laws that regulate vice, laws that would regulate, for example, in the case of prohibition, the consumption of alcohol, laws regulating gambling, uh, 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 recreational drugs, uh, and so forth. So, um, how can a virtues theorist answer this challenge? Uh, I'm, I can offer only a sketchy answer in the minute or two that remains to me, but I would like to emphasize two things. One thing is that autonomy is part of virtue. That 
a virtuous human, a human who's developed her capacities to the fullest, uh, possesses autonomy in, in a very important sense. Right? They are able to develop their own life plan and choose their own ends, right? Because that's what an excellent human can do. Autonomy is part of a naturally good human life because we are rational creatures. So autonomy is not to be ignored. What about the control of vice? I'd, I'd like to suggest that this is a matter for practical wisdom. Critics of virtue jurisprudence sometimes insist that a virtue jurisprudence must be uh, a jurisprudence that endorses uh, the prohibition of recreational drugs, for example. And possibly it is, but that is not necessarily the case. Uh, whether uh, gambling and drugs or alcohol is to be prohibited Right, depends entirely on the circumstances. If uh, drug prohibition leads to the destruction of communities because illegal drugs uh, promote a culture of crime and violence, uh, then a virtue jurisprudence last of all, least of all, would sanction prohibition as the appropriate social response. Uh, what would the appropriate social response be? Not neutrality, not indifference, right? But instead, uh, the use of the most effective means uh, to create the conditions in which people will have the capacity uh, to uh, make choices that will promote their own flourishing. That might be education, that might be treatment, it might be other things. So, uh, my time has come to an end, uh, and I uh, uh, will leave you with just uh, a single thought, which is this, that um, when we study law, we think a lot about consequences, and we think a lot about uh, rights and fairness. And I hope after the lecture today, you will also think about virtue. Thank you. So we have uh, several minutes left for questions, and I have been instructed to uh, recognize people from the podium. Yes, Garrick. I uh, was very interested in, in your description of practical wisdom, especially the broader uh, understanding of the virtues and virtues of the virtues. And I wondered if you could just say a little more about this, because when you were describing it in the beginning, it sounded like you were talking about sort of a an intuitive, tacit coping skill that some people have and others might lack as opposed to a learned perceptual capacity that you could gain over time. But in describing judicial practical wisdom, it sounded like you were talking about sort of the, the wisdom of accumulated experience in dealing with case after case. Um, and the reason that I ask about uh, whether it might be in some sense also a tacit coping skill that's in some folks mental makeup and and perhaps others need to spend more time developing is uh, I've seen recently some work on uh, neuroscientific studies of moral decision-making complexes in the brain and and uh, fMRI studies of that and I just I wonder if you can say anything about whether that's revealed the center of practical wisdom or, or something and so and psychologists are now investigating practical wisdom or wisdom more generally. It's a hot topic in psychology. Uh, and of course, contemporary psychologists explore this as a topic within cognitive science, using all the tools of cognitive science. Uh, here's what Aristotle said 
that is directly relevant to your question. Aristotle said there are no moral prodigies. Uh, there can be mathematical prodigies or chess prodigies, right? The, the, the virtue of theoretical wisdom, uh, of calculative ability is such that you can be a very brilliant chess player as a 12-year-old, uh, and you can be an astonishing uh, mathematician uh, 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 even in your late teens, uh, and there are famous examples of this, uh, but um, there is no one who has the kind of practical wisdom that would allow them to run a complex human institution at the age of 12 or 17. No one would want uh, even the most brilliant 17-year-old as the dean of their law school. No, no one uh, would want uh, 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 even the most brilliant 12-year-old on the bench. Uh, and that is because the development of practical wisdom is intimately connected to uh, experience. Uh, and now cognitive science might have something to say about exactly what that connection is. So for example, it might be that what practical wisdom is, is the building up of uh, the capacity to recognize complex patterns of human interaction and that these, this pattern recognition is something that our, our brain is naturally suited for, that we're naturally able to do, but that um, it just takes a long time to develop. Uh, and so uh, sort of full human maturity on this account uh, uh, would correspond more with the hobbit rule for adulthood than the human rule for adulthood. Hobbits thought you became an adult, as I recall, at 33, right? And uh, uh, we allow people to become president of the United States at 36, uh, uh, whereas the law recognizes you as an adult at age 18. And I'm not saying that 18-year-olds should not have the right to vote. I'm just saying that they uh, have not yet fully developed practical wisdom, so there are many social roles that w would be inappropriate for them to occupy. So whatever excesses a lawyer might exhibit, there's somebody else to hold them in check. And the Constitution, uh, checks on the legislature, the executives, uh, the judges, and especially the majority. Uh, so we don't have to worry about this. So, uh, well, I just want to say that I agree uh, with, uh, entirely agree with your, the thrust of your comment. So, uh, and I just want to say a word about the way that virtue relates to institutional design. So if you look back, for example, at the Federalist Papers, the uh, essays written by Hamilton and Madison uh, and Jay uh, defending the Constitution uh, uh, in the debates over its ratification, you will see uh, in their discussions a lot of virtue talk. Uh, and why was that there? Well, on the one hand, uh, they recognized uh, that uh, human societies are not ideal, that uh, uh, the very best that human beings uh, can achieve uh, is not going to be a society in which each and every person has fully acquired the virtues. That's uh, a, an ideal to be strived for, but it's not something that's practically possible. Uh, and that many humans uh, will be consumed uh, by their own interest and, uh, 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 and insufficiently attentive uh, to the common good. Uh, and therefore, they tried to design uh, an institutional structure that uh, would guard against vice and that would attempt to create a system where uh, humans of virtue 
would uh, occupy leadership positions. So they sort of had a dual strategy. On the one hand, the strategy of separate divide and divided powers and, and federalism, so that one vicious leader of a faction could not um, uh, gain control of the whole machinery of government. Uh, uh, something that we uh, recognize is all too easy to occur with disastrous consequences. And that strategy was combined with a system that was aimed at setting up a set of, in, uh, of institutions that would lead to the emergence of virtue at the highest levels. Uh, so uh, probably wrongly, they thought that this was a role that would be played by the Electoral College. And, and also probably wrongly, they thought that um, the appointment of senators by state legislatures legislatures would lead to the emergence of particularly uh, virtuous senators, the elect of the elect. Um, and, you know, we, 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 in retrospect, we see that this task of institutional design is extraordinarily difficult and complex, and that it's easy to set up a structure that won't do what you intended it to do. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at sort of the total picture of our Constitution, it looks like, you know, they did a better job than many other institutional designers in accomplishing these two aims. So uh, what I would say is that there's a virtue side of the story that you've told, and it's an essential and important side of the story. And we have time for one, one more question. Yes. Well, you know, virtue, so, so the study of virtue was uh, neglected for, for a very long time. Uh, there are uh, exceptions to this, but uh, uh, from uh, the emergence of the modern era uh, in philosophy, from the time of Kant and Bentham, until the 1950s, uh, virtue was an almost entirely neglected topic in moral philosophy. And, and as a result of that, uh, law schools, uh, the, the way I like to put this is law schools uh, 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 lag about 20 years behind other disciplines. Law schools are fantastic at synthesizing knowledge, but always 20 years later than uh, when events occur in the primary discipline. So uh, uh, in law schools, uh, uh, virtue-based approaches didn't really uh, begin to emerge in any significant way until around 1990 or so. In moral philosophy had happened about 30 years before that. So at least in my world, in the world of academics, I think that it is actually true that progress has been made uh, uh, and that um, even those who maintain their allegiance to Kant or Bentham, uh, even the most committed utilitarians and deontologists now see that virtue has to be part of their story. Uh, and so I would say we've made a lot of progress. Thanks. Thank you.